Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to begin in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for the computer to recognize that we have a PowerPoint coming. Um, I'm Ms. Gallanter, Amy Gallanter. I'm a new guidance counselor here, so that's probably why I'm not looking familiar to many of you. Um, I am helping students that are usually in the beginning of the alphabet. So if you have any questions or you want to talk to me about anything afterwards, I'm happy to help. Um, today we have Sheila Knezny, who's here from the Massachusetts Educational Financial Authority, to talk to us about FAFSA and the changes that are going on with that. Um, I was originally going to talk about scholarships a bit later in the program, but I'm just going to touch on it now since we're waiting for the computer to reboot. But just so you guys know, on the guidance webpage, we do have a scholarship update that we do update about every six weeks. Um, scholarships really come around mainly once January hits. They start with the national scholarships, then the regional and the local ones. So those are really later in the game, but just to keep your eye out on them, and then you can be checking up every you know six weeks for the new updates. That was very quick. Let me, let me just start off by uh, introducing myself a little bit more. My name is Sheila Knezny. I'm the Associate Director of Financial Aid at UMass Amherst. I've been there for over 30 years doing financial aid. Um, I have put two of my own children through college and I've been through this process of financial aid. I know you're going to say, oh, it's easier for you because you understand financial aid. But keep in mind that every school has its own process. And I'm just going to give you a couple of tips that I learned along the way that have been so helpful in both my son's college experience and my daughter's college experience. So what you can do for yourselves right now is if there are colleges that your sons and daughters are interested in, start a folder and put the name of that college on e each folder, so a separate folder for each school. And you will be absolutely amazed how much you're going to fill up that folder between now and when um, they make their decision about what college they actually want to attend. And in that folder, you're going to put everything that you possibly need to have so that when that time comes that you're making that decision about what school to attend, you're going to open up that folder and you're going to go through all the information that you've accumulated and it's going to help you make your decision. So if there are scholarships that they get, merit scholarships. Now a merit scholarship, we're going to talk about a little bit in this presentation. Um, they give you that merit scholarship letter in the first year and you put it in the folder and you kind of forget about it. But then in the second year you say, now what were the terms of that scholarship that I got? And you're going to go back to that folder and you're going to look at that merit scholarship and you're going to say, oh, yes, that's right. They need to maintain a 3.0 GPA or whatever the GPA is or whatever the requirements are. Um, so it's been really helpful for me to develop those folders. The other piece of advice that I can give to you, and it's actually kind of nice that we're doing these seminars a little bit early because we're just starting off the school year, so it's not like you're already deep in the process. And you've said, geez, I wish I had known that sooner. So the other piece of advice that I can share with you is to develop a separate email account. People, schools are not going to be sending you paper. They're going to be communicating with you over email. And the last thing you want to do is have that responsibility, perhaps, with your son or daughter, because email is not their primary means of communication, texting is. And so if you have like a separate Gmail account or a Yahoo account, and you put that on all your admission applications, and you put that on your financial aid application, then all of the requests for information and everything is going to go to that Gmail account and you're going to know the password for it, and you're going to be able to look at the information right along with your son or daughter. I can't tell you how helpful it was to have that dedicated email account. It was extremely helpful. Um, so, um, what else can I tell you? Start early. So, you've got this FAFSA application process that opens up on October 1st. So, and you're going to be using 2015's information. So as soon as you are ready, start filling out that FAFSA form. Are we ready to start the presentation? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. 
So because I don't have the presentation in front of me, it's behind me, we're going to be using a little cue system. Next, ready, one of those things. Um, so it's really nice that you all came to this presentation tonight. You're going to be learning lots of information about financial aid. Um, we'll be taking your questions as we go along. So if you've got a question and you want to just raise your hand, give me, just put your hand up, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, this is a timely presentation for seniors, but it's also really helpful for sophomores and juniors. So if there are any sophomores or junior families in the crowd, um, congratulations, you're planning early. It's never too early to think about college financing. Um, it certainly is an important part of the whole senior year experience and figuring out what college you want to go to. So the earlier you start, the better. Um, there are handouts. Did they, everybody get the handouts? So there are handouts and there is also an evaluation form. I work at UMass Amherst um, and what happens is we do this on behalf of MIFA. Um, so let's, next slide please, we can share a little bit about what MIFA does. MIFA is a not-for-profit authority that was created in 1982. And their whole thing is to help families plan, save, and pay for college. It's a great organization. And so what I am known as is a MIFA ambassador. And so MIFA puts this presentation together and financial aid staff from across the state go out through the high schools in Massachusetts and do these presentations just so that you have a really better understanding of this whole financial aid application process. Have, have any of you heard of MIFA? Can I see a show of hands if anyone has heard? Great, excellent. MIFA.org is their website address and they have all kinds of helpful information on that website. And if we've got some competing agenda on the outside. So um, I encourage you to follow MIFA on social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, they're out there. And if you sign up for the MIFA emails, it, which is part of the evaluation form tonight, um, they send really timely topics. So right now, the timely topic would be about um, filling out this financial aid application and going through the application process. But as we get through the year, they will also have uh, information about helping you choose the school. And then they do have presentations, I think they're in May, that the, the financial aid counselors and the MIFA staff go out to area high schools and you bring your acceptance letter and your financial aid letter and they help you make the decision about what college is the right college for you. Okay, we're ready, next one. So this is the most important slide of the night. You can do this. I don't know if you've heard stories about applying for financial aid or you have some preconceived notions about the process, but by the time you walk out of here tonight, you'll say to yourself, I can do this. It's, I got this down. So this is a really important slide. You can do this. Okay, we're ready for the next one. So here's our agenda for tonight. We're going to be talking about the types and sources of financial aid. We're going to be talking about the application process. We're going to talk about how financial aid decisions are made. And then we're going to talk about paying for college and then free resources. Okay, next slide. So first we're going to talk about the types and sources of financial aid. Next slide. So what is financial aid? So financial aid is money that helps students pay for college. And it comes from three main sources. There are the grants and scholarships, which is the gift aid. This is the best kind of financial aid. You don't have to pay it back. Um, examples of uh, gift aid scholarships could be a federal Pell Grant, which is awarded to the neediest of students who apply for financial aid. It could be in the form of institutional financial aid. At UMass Amherst, it would be known as a UMass Amherst Grant. It can be from the state of Massachusetts, if you're eligible, it will be known as a Mass Grant State Scholarship. These are all free sources of financial aid. It's the best kind of financial aid. It's what everybody wants. 
and it's free and it doesn't have to be repaid. The second kind of financial aid is federal work study, a work study. So what work study is, is it's a financial aid award at UMass Amherst, it's $2,000. So $1,000 is for the fall semester, $1,000 is for the spring semester, and it's basically a campus job. And so the benefit to the student to have a federal work study award is it helps pay for the indirect expenses. And as we get to the part of the slide that talks about uh, cost, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Work study can't be used to pay the bill. It has to be earned. The benefit to the student is next year when they're applying for financial aid, any earnings that they had through the federal work study program are considered financial aid, not income, so it doesn't count towards their student contribution, the part of the expected family contribution. The benefit to the employers on campus is they're always paying a small percentage of that student's wage. So we can hire perhaps three times as many work study students as non-work study students. On most college campuses, you don't have to have federal work study in order to have a campus job. It's just that because of that, employers are only paying a portion of the wages, it's more attractive for them to hire students who have federal work study funds. And then the third kind of financial aid is federal student loans. This is a, the, the reason this is considered a form of financial aid is because it's a low interest rate, the student applies for the loan on their own. They don't need a co-borrower. Um, and, and it's a fixed interest rate, so it's a really low interest rate. And the subsidized direct student loan, they don't pay until after they graduate from college, and that includes if they go on to graduate school. So the other important point with the work study and the student loans is you don't have to accept it. You certainly can decline that. Okay, next slide. So merit-based aid. So merit-based aid, we talked a little bit about that at the beginning. So you want to make sure that you have a really good understanding of what that merit-based scholarship is, is that's being awarded to your son or daughter. Because it's usually based on either academic achievement, athletic achievement, some sort of extracurricular activity. So it's it's not they're being they're being selected amongst their peers. Um, and you want to make sure that you understand the terms of that merit scholarship. I'm going to give you two examples. So when my son was uh, applying to colleges, he was awarded a freshman scholarship. So you would think that freshman scholarship is only for the freshman year. No, that was the name of the scholarship. He got the scholarship for all four years. It just happened to be known as the freshman scholarship. So make sure that you ask a lot of questions, make sure that you understand what the right renewal criteria is, especially if that's going to be one of those deciding factors for you about the college that they attend. Um, so you want to make sure that they can maintain that GPA if there is a GPA associated with it. Some of those merit scholarships you need to maintain, for, for example, a 3.8 GPA. So a 3.8 GPA out of a 4.0 GPA, sure, it might be a really great scholarship, but can you still afford that school if you lose that scholarship? The other merit scholarship that I'm going to talk a moment about is the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. The John and Abigail Adams Scholarship is actually a tuition <coughs> waiver and students need to maintain a 3.0 GPA in order to keep that. So that's awarded through the state of Massachusetts. All right, next slide. So now we're going to talk about need-based aid. So need-based aid is probably what most of us know as financial aid. It's based on a family's financial, aid, financial eligibility or their need. Um, the eligi eligibility is determined by a standard criteria that everyone uh, is being, it's being used for everyone. For example, it's known as federal methodology. So if we're awarding financial aid to students, the federal government has a say in how we use it, how that formula is determined, and it's known as federal methodology. Colleges can also offer institutional funds using that federal methodology. 
but most federal and Massachusetts financial aid funds are awarded based on financial eligibility. Now, in order to maintain eligibility for financial aid, students have to be making satisfactory academic progress. This thing's going to fall over if I let go. Bonus points. So we'll do a point this for a few minutes. Um, let's talk about satisfactory academic progress. So satisfactory academic progress, in order to maintain eligibility once students enroll in the college, they need to maintain, there's two parts to it. So after four semesters, they need to have a 2.0 GPA in order to remain eligible. And then they have to be progressing towards graduation, so there's the credit part of it. So after each semester, they need to have passed a certain amount of credits. And this is known as satisfactory academic progress, and every semester or every year, uh, colleges are going to look at a student's academic performance to make sure that they're maintaining satisfactory academic progress. So now we're going to talk about, next slide, the um, sources of financial aid. We talked a little bit about this a few minutes ago when we were talking about federal Pell Grants. So for the federal government is one source of financial aid. Most grants um, from the federal government are allocated to the lower income families. So when you get your information back from the federal government, it's going to talk to you about your eligibility for a Pell Grant, which is the federal form of financial aid. Um, most state grants are also allocated to based on need. And so we're using the same kind of formula to calculate eligibility for financial aid. And then we already talked about scholarships, so we're just going to keep going. So next slide. There is, there is one, one more thing about this slide. There is um, a tab, if you go to mefa.org, about scholarships. So the other thing that I can tell you is, in addition to what Ms. Gallanter was talking about in terms of scholarships, you want to make sure that you are doing your own scholarship search. And you want to make sure that any of those schools that you're looking for, looking at right now in terms of admission, that you're also asking them about their scholarships. Because lots of schools have deep scholarships, you know, that say alumni have awarded, given the school money and created scholarships. So I know the, the school that my son went to, they gave him a book that was about this thick on scholarships. And it's, it's your own responsibility to be looking at these scholarships. And some of them might require that you do an essay. Some of them might require that there's a separate application process. So you want to make sure that in addition to what the high school is doing for you, that you're doing your own search for scholarships as well. That's very important. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, the breakdown of financial aid. So this slide gives you a little bit of information about where the money is coming from. So my big takeaway with this slide is to see that there's $183.9 billion in scholarship money that was awarded in 2014-15. And then you see the breakdown. And sure, that circle is pretty large for student loans. It'd be nice if we could get that a little bit smaller, but it makes up a big portion of student loans. And I'm always fascinated at how small, let me see, I gotta pull it up so I can look at it myself. the work study. So it's that little less than 1%. Our financial aid office wouldn't be able to function without work study students. We have about 50 students that work in our office, and they are such an important part of our, our office. And I still can't believe it's less than 1% of the financial aid funds. But if your son or daughter is a board of work study, it's, it certainly is a great thing. Um, so next we're going to talk about the application process. So we can go two slides. Go. Okay, great. Okay. So that FAFSA, isn't it amazing that students can apply for financial aid for 2017-18 and three days, October 1st? I'm fascinated at this. So I've been working in financial aid for over 30 years, and I think this is the first time that I've done a financial aid night that it's not dark and cold. So. Um, the process opens up on October 1st, 
and no longer will you be using estimated information. There's a, a good likelihood that probably the vast majority of you in this office will have completed your 2015 tax return. So the free application for federal student aid, better known as the FAFSA, needs to be completed on a yearly basis. So if this is the first time that you're applying for financial aid, you're gonna fill out that application from start to finish. And you wanna use the, uh, the um, online application. Don't get creative and try to use the paper application. Make sure that you use the online application because the online application has built-in edits in the application process and it won't let you go to the next slide or the next section if you've done some fatal mistake on it. Whereas if you fill out that paper application, you're gonna get it in the mail and you're not gonna get it back until maybe six weeks later and they're gonna say that you made a mistake and you need to start all over again. So you wanna make sure that you fill out the application online at fafsa.gov. You wanna make sure that you have your FSA ID and that's something that you can do right now, ahead of time. Get your FSA ID. So students, if there are students in the audience, you have your own FSA ID. Parents, you have an FSA ID. If you have other children who are in college and you already have an FSA ID, you get to use the same one. You don't need a separate one. So you've got that folder where you've got every school that you're interested in. And in that folder, you want to make sure that you write down what the financial aid application process is for each school and what their deadline is. And you do not want to miss the deadline. Absolutely, positively do not miss the deadline for applying for financial aid. And make sure that you understand the process. So every school is going to require that you fill out that FAFSA form. That is a requirement for every single school. Now some schools, the higher end schools that have more endowment funds, are going to ask you to also fill out a profile form. So the profile form is going to cost you $25 for the first school and then $16 for each additional school. But there could also be a third application and that would be an institutional application. So some schools can require that you fill out three different financial aid applications a federal application, FAFSA, the profile form, and an institutional application. And you wanna make sure that you understand the process for each school and you understand what the deadline is because each school can have their own application deadline. Did I leave anything else? Some schools may run out of money, so it's really important that you apply as soon as you have your information ready. I know when we were doing the training for this workshop, one of the schools did say, you know, we were talking about, well, is it really important for families to fill this form out starting October 1st? Yes, it is, because depending on the schools that you're applying for, they may apply for, they may award their financial aid on a first come, first serve basis. So you don't know what the process is for all these different schools. You don't know if they're going to run out of money. So you want to get your application in. If you know that there's potentially schools that you're interested in, the FAFSA form will let you send information to 10 schools. So each school has its own unique code at UMass Amherst, it's 002221. And so when you're filling out that financial aid application, it roots it to UMass Amherst based on that code. So if your son or daughter has more than 10 schools that they're interested in applying to, you can't take a school off until you make sure that the school that you're taking off has uploaded that information, okay? They're not gonna be able to upload it more than likely until they're admitted, okay? So you might be in a little bit of a holding pattern right now if there's more than 10 schools that you're interested, you're, they're interested in applying to but get the 10 most important ones on the initial application. Make sure I got all my information in. The IRS data retrieval tool. Let's talk about the IRS data retrieval tool. So for many of you, you will be able to upload your tax information directly from the IRS. 
So when you're filling out your FAFSA form, it's going to ask you, is this from a completed tax return? And if you answer yes to that question, a pop-up box is going to come onto your application. And you're going to answer a series of questions. And then you're going to have the opportunity to say, would you like to upload your information from the IRS website, from the IRS? So if you answer yes, your application will go out and retrieve your tax information directly from the IRS and upload it onto your FAFSA application. It's pretty slick. Okay, I'm ready for the next slide. So what's reported on that FAFSA form? Uh, your citizenship status, so you need to be a citizen in order to, or eligible non-citizen to apply for financial aid. Um, so if you are a DACA student, do you have any DACA students here at Amherst Regional? Deferred Action, Childhood Rivals, okay. And we won't have to talk about that. Um, you're going to be entering the, the colleges where you're applying. We kind of talked about that already. We're going to be putting in parents and student information, your marital status, so if you are in a same-sex relationship and you're married, you want to answer yes that you're married. Divorced and separated families, it's just the custodial parents' information that's filling out that FAFSA form. The profile form is going to ask for the non-custodial parent statement, so there will be information requested. And if there's an institutional application, the non-custodial information will be asked on that. Um, it's going to be asking for your 2015 income, okay? And then it's going to ask you about your assets. So when you're filling out your FAFSA form, pay your bills first, because the FAFSA form is asking for your assets as of the day that you're filling out this form. So make sure that you pay all your monthly bills before you answer the question about what your cash assets are. And then it'll ask you questions about the number in the family, and the number in college, and make sure that you include the high school senior and the number in college, okay? So if there are some families in the audience or you know about down the road that have not filled out the 2015 tax return for whatever reason, if they filed some extension or they have something going on, it's more important to estimate the income and fill out that FAFSA form than it is to wait until the tax data comes in. So make sure um, that you estimate your income. So just to reiterate your question so you can all hear. So, um, did I hear you correctly? I would put in the number of the senior in high school and the number in college on this box of one. Yes, that is correct. You're assuming that they're going to be in 2017-18, in September of 2017, that they will be a freshman in college. Any more questions? Yeah. What if the family So very good question, so I'll just repeat it. So what if the 2016, it would be 2016's income, is different from the 2015, or you're going all the way into 2017? So in 2007, it really depends on the school, what year they're going to look at, because typically what happens when you're filling out financial aid applications and doing an appeal, we'll talk about appeals a little bit later in the presentation, that you have your base year that you're filling out your FAFSA form with, which is 2015's information. And usually you can go one year into the future, so that would be 2016's. So if something is happening in 2017, which hasn't even started yet, you want to wait until 2017 happens, whatever event is happening in 2017, then you would want to contact that school and let the, or schools and let them know because each school will have their own process for looking at. There's no way to modify that. Follow-up question, there's no way to modify that FAFSA form. No, you must fill it out with 2015's information. Yeah? 
bit about Social Security. Um, it, one of the questions that is not included. So one of the questions on the FAFSA form is untaxed Social Security benefits. Okay. And you want to follow the instructions on the application for whether or not those Social Security benefits Um, so the question is, you had said that there's a do your own research on scholarships. There's a whole section of this presentation that talks about resources. So when we get to that, you'll... Uh, the other thing, too, is this presentation is available on the MIFA.org website. So if you don't feel like you have to take copious notes and um, because... And I think I have a serious sneaking suspicion that they're taking me. So you want to go back and... NIFA.org. Sure there is. So the question is, I'm the parent of a junior, and I don't really have to do the FAFSA. Is there a way to do it? It's called FAFSA with a four caster. Okay? And that's in the presentation. Um, so if you are the parent of a junior or sophomore and you just want to get a feel for the application process, it's called FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A, with the number four, and then C-A-S-T-E-R. And it's within the FAFSA website. about the profile form. We talked about it a little bit already. It is required by some colleges. Oh, the other thing that I can share with you, some of the colleges, um, this happened to my daughter. She decided that she was going to fill out her application for one of the schools that she was applying to. And she said that she was not applying for financial aid. And so then I filled out the financial aid application and sent it to the school. And they immediately contacted me and said that you said you were not applying for financial aid. So depending on the schools that they're applying to, um, applications get rooted, get rooted in different directions depending on whether or not they're applying for financial aid. So uh, make sure you think about that question on the admission application for some of the colleges because it will ask if you anticipate that you're applying for financial aid at some of the schools. Um, so the profile form is required for some colleges. It's $25 for the first school, $16 for each additional school. So wait until you're pretty certain that they're applying for the, to those schools, applying for admission to those schools, um, to fill out the profile application. It's an online application, collegeboard.org slash profile is where the application can be found. Uh, the non-custodial parent profile form is often required. And NEFA has a great webinar on their website that will kind of walk you through. It's a webinar that kind of talks about filling out the profile form. So if you anticipate that you have to fill out the profile form, um, go on to the reef.org and watch the webinar. Um, this is another spot that it's, while it's optional, when you're filling out the, the common application, it is optional whether or not you put in the social security number on that common application. If you anticipate that you're applying for financial aid, you want to make sure that you include the social security number on the common application because that is how many colleges match up identity between the admission information and financial aid information. So that's just another important point to keep along the way. Some schools will select students for verification. So verification is basically confirming the information that you have put down on that FAFSA form with your tax information and then other data that talks that asks questions about the household size and the number in college. 
Um, 30% of federal uh, financial aid applications by each school get selected for verification. But some schools will do 100% verification. Other schools will verify the entire freshman class. So there are institutional um, considerations for schools to think about in terms of the verification process. Um, so if you fill out your application, then you've made errors on it, then the schools will go in and correct that information. So you want to make sure that your application for financial aid is as accurate as possible, because if we are selecting you for verification, we're going to go back and correct that information and perhaps change the financial aid award. Alright, we're going to go to the next slide. So now we're on to after you apply. So, so after you apply for financial aid, your information is electronically processed at the Central Processing Center, and then it's sent to the colleges. But then you are also sent a student aid report, a SAR. And on that student aid report, it lists all of the information that you have put down on your FAFSA form, and it, this is your chance to update and correct your information. Because your financial aid application is the data that the school is going to use to put together your financial aid award. And you want to make sure that that information is as accurate as possible. And so when you get that student aid report in the mail, you want to make sure that you review it very carefully. Now it's going to be sent to that email address that you put down on your FAFSA form. So hopefully as parents you have access, you've set up that unique email address and you can go out there when you get notice that your student aid report is available and you can correct your information when you're um, making a correction to FAFSA. You would go on to FAFSA.gov and make a correction to your information and you would use your FSA ID and the student FSA ID to make that correction. This is also a chance for you if you if you didn't use the IRS data retrieval tool and you can correct your information using the IRS data retrieval tool. All right, next slide. So now we're on to how financial aid decisions are made. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the cost of attendance. So the cost of attendance is not only tuition and fees. So what we're doing in the financial aid office is putting together a living budget. What is it truly going to cost that student to be a student for nine months? So in addition to tuition and fees and room and board, we put in a, an allowance for books. We know that students are going to have to buy books. We put in an allowance for travel. There will be certain times in the year that the university or college campus will be closed and that student will have to leave the campus. So there is a, an allowance for travel. And then there's also an allowance for personal expenses. I always like to use the example of the student who comes to Massachusetts from California, they're going to need a winter coat, winter clothes. So what we're doing in the financial aid office is putting together a living budget. So when you go on to these college websites and you see the cost of attendance, that's why the financial aid cost of attendance may be different than what you see on the admission um, cost of attendance website page because the financial aid cost of attendance is including those indirect expenses. Okay? So, next slide. Now we're going to talk about the expected family contribution. So the expected family contribution is a calculated amount that the family has the ability <coughs> to absorb in one year. The expected family contribution is purely a calculation and we're using that federal formula that the government um, demands that we use in order to calculate financial aid eligibility. It's called federal methodology. And so we're putting together um, that expected family contribution, the EFC. Some colleges will also have another calculation running as well, and it's called institutional methodology. So for all of the federal and the state financial aid, they must use federal methodology. But for their, say their endowed scholarships, they can put together their own methodology. It's known as institutional methodology to avoid their merit scholarships or their endowed scholarships. Um, 
The other reason that expected family contribution gets calculated is because the family has the primary responsibility for paying for college. So after that expected family contribution is calculated, then financial aid funds become available. So there are some really good ESP calculators, calculators out there. So if you want to go in and, and kind of anticipate what your expected family contribution would be, or for the family that says that in 2017 your income is going to be very different, you can go on to one of these ESC calculators and put your information in and calculate what your expected family contribution may be. Uh, the FAFSA forecaster on FAFSA.gov will do the same thing for you. It will put together what your um, expected family contribution will be. And keep in mind that the parent information and the student information is treated differently in the, in the formula. Um, parent assets are calculated at maybe a little over 5%, where student assets, 20% of the student asset becomes the student contribution from, from uh, their assets. So there's actually four parts to that expected family contribution. The parent contribution from income, the parent contribution from assets, the student contribution from income, and the student contribution from assets. So those four parts combine to be known as the expected family contribution. And you can expect more than likely to pay more for college than what that expected family contribution is. So that, that formula is very complicated and it's, it's, it's very much income driven. And so that's why it's really important that you make sure that your, your tax information is correct. I've had families say to me, I don't understand it, Sheila. My income hasn't changed from one year to the next, but my financial aid award changed. And you, you'll look at their tax information, and you'll see that from one year to the next, they're not paying as much U.S. income tax. So because they're not paying as much U.S. income tax, they have more income available to them, and their expected family contribution would be higher. So, next slide. So, each college website is required to have a net price calculator. So, this online tool can be found on each school's website. It shouldn't be hard to find. Um, it will ask questions about your, your family finances and student academics, and it will provide you with a, net, a personal estimated net college price after financial aid funds. And it should display the federal and the institutional financial aid, and in some cases, the merit financial aid, merit scholarships, will also be calculated. Um, net price calculators do not include the full cost of college, so commuters and housing credits will affect that net, net price calculator. But this is also a really good tool for you to have a good sense of what it's going to cost you for each school. Next slide. Thank you. So here's the financial aid formula that we're using. We're using that financial aid cost of attendance, the COA, and we're subtracting the expected family contribution, and that equals the student's need for financial aid. Okay. So if a student has a zero ESC, they're going to be eligible for the grants and scholarships from the federal government, from the state, from the institution. They'll be eligible perhaps for the work study awards, They'll be eligible for the student loans. So a student with an expected family contribution of zero will have great eligibility for financial aid, just as the student who has a really high expected family contribution will have uh, less eligibility for financial aid. Next slide. So first, we're going to talk about <coughs> how assets affect that expected family contribution. <clears throat> so we have family A, B, and C, and they all earn $75,000. Okay. And you can see that family A has no assets, family B has $75,000 in assets, and family C has $150,000 in assets. And you can see, while that expected family contribution does rise from family A to family C, it's not that significant, considering that you're talking about 
zero assets to $150,000 in assets. So this slide is there to kind of show you that your saving for college should not impact your eligibility for financial aid significantly. It's important to save for college. Um, so if some of you in the audience have 529 accounts, uh, those are considered the asset of the parent, not the student. And they're treated the same manner as every other asset. So if you've saved for college through a 529 account, it is considered the asset of the owner. And as parents, you must list the 529 accounts for all of the children that you have a 529 account for, not just the student who you're filling out that FAFSA form. Parent assets are assessed at 5.6%. Student assets are assessed at 20%. We we'll talked about that a little bit. Um, okay, so now the next slide is how income has an impact on the EOC. And this slide is to, to um, show you how important the income is in the formula. So you have family A, B, and C. Family A earned $75,000. They all families have $50,000 in assets. And you can see from family A with that $75,000 income to family C with $150,000 income, the impact that it has on that expected family contribution. It's much more significant than those assets. Okay, so now the next slide. So now we're going to talk about how the formula works. So we have the cost of college that's on the this way down, and then we have a, a family with a five thousand dollar expected family contribution. So this this slide helps to illustrate that. While that expected family contribution is going to stay the same from college A to college D, college D, they're not going to have any eligibility for financial aid. Perhaps that's a community college. College C, there's some eligibility for financial aid. College B, it gets greater. And then college A, which is the most expensive college, there's a significant amount of financial aid eligibility. And so, what this, not only is this slide illustrating that that expected family contribution is going to stay the same no matter the cost, it's to help you understand that you should be applying to colleges that are maybe outside your financial box in terms of thinking that you can afford that college because that college may have significant endowed funds or scholarships available. So you should be having a nice, array of schools that you're applying for, not only ones that you um, perceive that you're eligible to afford, but maybe the ones that you don't think you can afford, they may have generous scholarship opportunities. Okay, now we're on to the next slide, which is uh, the barrel. So you can go ahead and fill up the barrel all the way to the top, because I prefer to have it this way in my presentation. So this college, the cost of attendance, is $40,000, okay? And so we talked about that the family has the primary responsibility for paying for college. So the first thing that goes in the barrel is the expected family contribution. So the next thing in the barrel are scholarships. Now those scholarships might be merit scholarships. They may be some sort of athletic scholarship. But that's the next thing in the barrel is the scholarships. The next kind of financial aid in the barrel would be the grants. That's the best kind of financial aid. And then after that would be the student loans and the work study. And there are very few schools that meet 100% need. So then at the top of the barrel is the unmet need. So unmet need is need that the student has that the college is not funding. So in addition to that expected family contribution, which is $5,000. This school has a $3,000 unmet need. So the family's portion of paying for college is $8,000. And then this, this barrel has work study for $3,500 in that barrel. So 
So remember, work study can't be used as a payment against the bill. It has to be earned by the student. It helps pay those indirect expenses. So if the student is, it helps them with their personal expenses. It might help them with their travel. Um, the, the work study is funding those indirect expenses. But it can't be used to pay the bill. So um, five and three is eight. $11,500 is the family's responsibility, essentially, in this barrel, okay? Okay, so now we're on to looking at award letters. So each school has their own way of awarding financial aid. So once again, we're at that school that costs $40,000. This slide is helping you illustrate that award letters are gonna vary. Each school's award letter is gonna look a little bit different. So we have that cost of attendance, that's $40,000. We have a $5,000 expected family contribution. So the student's eligibility for financial aid is $35,000. So college A, B, and C has done it all a little bit different. College A gave $26,000 in financial aid. College C <clears throat> gave $18,000 in financial aid. So every school has their own way of awarding financial aid funds. They all gave the maximum student loans for freshmen, which is $5,500. They all gave $3,500 in, in work study. So you can see that some school, that first school has zero on that need. The second school has a $3,000 on that need, and the third school has $8,000. <clears> so every school is going to be a little bit different. And that's what that presentation or that seminar in, in April, I think it's in April, that MIFA does is help you to understand these award letters that you've gotten. <coughs> Actually, there's an online uh, interactive My College Cost Calculator on MIFA.org that you can also do once you get your financial aid award letters. <coughs> so now we're going to go to um, the next slide, please. So the next slide is also talking about college A, B, and C, same cost. Only in this school, college C didn't give any grant money at all. Maybe that's because they applied late. And that's usually what colleges will take away if they're a late applicant for financial aid. They're always going to be eligible for the federal financial aid funds. It's the institutional grant money that will disappear. So in this case, College C, perhaps that student was a late applicant for financial aid. But the thing that is present on this page is the parent loan. So College B and College C included a credit-based parent loan in that financial aid award. So they all arrived at the same $3,000 of unmet need, but they all achieved it in different ways. And be very wary of schools that include a parent loan, a credit-based loan, in their financial aid awards because that's something that you may or may not qualify as based on your credit rating. So now we're on to the next slide, <clears throat> paying for college. How are we gonna do that? So the most important thing that you want to think about when you're thinking about paying for college, or you're looking at the past, the present, and the future, and you're really putting together a financial plan that looks at all three of those. <clears throat> so if you had a college savings plan, that would be the past. Um, summer savings, uh, parent savings, that would be your past. You have <clears throat> some sort of savings that you've Put aside for college. Um, the present would be the parent contribution. It would be a payment plan. So a lot of colleges will offer a payment plan. For example, at UMass Amherst, you can enroll in a 10-month payment plan. Five payments go to the fall semester. Five payments go to the spring semester. So for an enrollment fee, I think it's $50. It might be a little bit more. For $50, you can enroll in a payment plan that allows you to spread the cost out over 10 payments. You decide how much you want to put in that payment plan. Okay, so 
you've got your, your college savings, you've got your past, your present. So after you've thought about the past and the present, if you still owe that college money for college expenses, the bill, then you want to think about the future, credit-based loans to help you pay. MIFA offers credit-based loans. Um, but there's lots of different credit-based loan options out there, the current loan for undergraduate students. That is a federal credit-based loan program that parents can apply for. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can save for, that you can pay for college. The other thing that I've reminded families about paying for college is if your son or daughter is going someplace far away from home, so say they're going to California to school, then what you need to be thinking about and you need to build this into your expenses is how much is it going to cost you to get that student home? And how many times are you going to have to get them home? They're going to perhaps come home for Thanksgiving. You're going to have to get them there in September. They may come home for Thanksgiving. They're definitely coming home at the end of the semester. You've got to get them back for spring semester. They're going to leave for a week in the spring semester for spring break. They're going to come home in May. And then you might want to add in one additional expense for emergencies. So if your son or daughter is traveling back and forth to college, then you want to build that into your expenses. So what I usually su suggest to families is calculate a flight, times it by however many times you think they're going to come home. And now add that into your cost of college because you will have to pay for it. So let's talk about student loans. Next slide. So the federal student loans, the student is the sole borrower. There's no credit check. There's a subsidized loan. A subsidized loan that means that the student doesn't begin repayment on that loan until six months after graduation. And they stop to be, or they stop to be enrolled at least half time. So if they stop out for a semester, their grace period, their six month grace period is calculating for them. They get one six month grace period if they're not enrolled um, or they're enrolled less than half time. So remember when I said there's something for everyone or you know there's financial aid for everyone? Well, that would be the unsubsidized student loan. So if a student's expected family contribution exceeds the cost of attendance, then they're eligible for an unsubsidized loan. So the federal government does not pay the interest while the student's in school. They start payment on that interest payment while they're in school, or they can postpone that payment, that interest payment, until after graduation through capitalization. But every year that loan is going to grow by the amount of the interest payment that that student is not making. So the loan limits. So an incoming freshman is eligible for $3,500 in a subsidized loan and $2,000 of an unsubsidized loan. So every grade level has $2,000 of unsubsidized loan eligibility included. So sophomores are eligible for $4,500 of a subsidized loan. And then juniors and seniors are eligible for $5,500. So as the student's grade progresses, their eligibility for loans may increase. So this is where you may see that unmet need go down because the student's loan eligibility will increase as they become uh, through their four years of college, or five. <laughs> Sometimes it's longer. Next slide, free resources. So there is a fast a day. So myself and uh, my colleague from Amherst College, we host a fast a night uh, in January. It's January 19th at Amherst Regional High School. I know the slide says a different date, but it's kind of like a um, generic date. So the date is January 19th. It's at Amherst Regional High School. You show up, and if you need help filling out your FAFSA, if you still haven't filled it out, there's also one on November 6, 2016. You, you would go on to fafsaday.org, and there are local places around here that are helping families fill out their financial aid application. 
So there's also the First Lady's Up Next mobile messaging tool, text college to 44044 for tips on all things college. And then there's, the other thing too is, any of the schools that you're applying to will have a very robust scholarship uh, website. And even the UMass Amherst website, it's not just for students who are going to UMass, it's for all students who are going to college. There's some really good resources out there on the financial aid website from UMass Amherst. The Educational Op Opportunity Centers offer assistance. Um, the IRS offers help in filling out your tax return if you need it. And let's see, I'm going to change the slide. Okay. This is when the MEPA webinars are. So if you want to get a better understanding of the FAFSA, that's Tuesday, 927, which is today. And also Thursday, January 15th. There's information about the profile form on Friday, uh, September 30th, paying for college. So all these different webinars that you can certainly um, go on to and listen to information about different topics. Next slide. And this is the paying for college seminars that um, provide assistance and clarity on financial aid awards, the college bill, payment plans, college loans, and what to ask the financial aid office. Okay. And the next slide. What you can do now. So you can sign up for the Meet the Emails. You can get an FSA ID on the, for the student and the parent. You can research deadlines and required applications. And you can start completing the application on October 1st. And if you could please take a moment to fill out the evaluation form. That is the last slide. And I put my name in there. First name is Sheila. And if you've got more questions, I will certainly answer your question. But if you've got questions that you would like to ask me privately after, I'd certainly will stay for a few minutes and answer your private questions. Yeah. Two questions, okay. Uh, 529 plan. 529. So the question is about your 529 account. You decide. So if the stock market is doing really good right now and you don't want to take any money out of your 529 account in freshman year and you want to let it just percolate a little bit longer, you can do that. You decide how you want to use your 529 account. Excuse me? So the question is, the question is, is there anything unique about applying for financial aid at UMass Amherst? Um, I have no tips and no secrets. Make sure that you apply to the deadline, March 1st. Um, and then you, you won't hear from UMass Amherst until they're admitted. So if they're applying early action, uh, they should hear they should hear sometime in December that they're admitted to the university and probably perhaps shortly after that we'll be sending out we'll be sending out the financial aid award. Okay. More questions? Yeah. Thirty five hundred. That's subsidized. Correct. Two thousand dollars a month. So the the loan limits are um, the subsidized loans thirty five hundred for freshmen, forty five hundred for sophomores, and fifty five hundred for juniors and seniors. And each grade level, in addition to that subsidized loan, has a two thousand dollar unsubsidized loan eligibility. Well, thank you.
you all for inviting me here tonight. And if you could fill out your evaluation forms, that would be great. And have a nice night.